And so we crossed the Atlantic once again to see what our American cousins were up to. The first written humour that we know of is from 1637, The New English Canaan, by Thomas Morton of Merrimount. This was a comedy of manners, full of wry observations of the natives and the English Puritan incomers. A wry observation, that's W-R-Y, almost equivalent to deadpan, downbeat, and setting the tone for a lot of the American humour that we're going to see. Halley's Comet appeared in the sky in 1835, just as Mark Twain was born, and knowing that it would take 75 or 76 years to come back, the writer said, I came in with Halley's Comet, I expect to go out with it. And he did, April 21st, 1910, just as the comet was coming within sight of Earth. In between times, he set the style for a certain kind of comic fiction with The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, but also wrote a lot for newspapers and let his sarcasm spill over into his theatre criticism at times. Reviewing one comic opera, he said, I haven't laughed so much since the orphanage burned down. And I believe Mark Twain is the original quotee of the often quoted Reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Born slightly later in 1842, Ambrose Bierce had his education cut off by the American Civil War. He became a Unionist soldier, ended up in San Francisco, where he socialised with criminals and prostitutes. Who better? His most famous legacy is a series of definitions. The Devil's Dictionary, which started as contributions to various newspapers, but were later collected up and published. There's some very nice urbane wit still embedded in there. For example, egotist, noun, a person of low taste, more interested in himself than in me. Lawyer, noun, one skilled in circumvention of the law. Love, noun, a temporary insanity, curable by marriage. And marriage, noun, a household consisting of a master, a mistress, and two slaves, making in all two. And as I said when I began to look at literary humour, I find this amusing, worthy of a chuckle. Not a lol, but creating a nice warm comedy sensation in the brain. As does William Faulkner's novel, As I Lay Dying. The story of a dysfunctional Mississippi family's funeral arrangements. This he wrote while working shifts in a factory over six weeks between midnight and 4am, according to him. Faulkner wrote other successful novels and went on to become a screenwriter. The Big Sleep is one of his. Speaking of screenwriters, we should mention S.J. Perelman, as the Marx Brothers often get credited with their witticisms, but they were scripted by Mr. Perelman, to whom I apologise because he really didn't like Groucho Marx and asked people never to mention it. James Thurber was known equally for his articles and his cartoons. In the segment on satire, we saw how comics and magazines could be a vehicle for comedy, but I've overlooked the more highbrow contributions of excellent magazines like The New Yorker, New Yorker cartoons became famous for their quality. But continuing with the classic novels, we can speed up to the 60s and find Philip Roth spinning Jewish masturbatory guilt out into a novel and Joseph Heller with Catch-22. And a special mention for Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas by Hunter S. Thompson, published in 1971, a kind of reimagined trip to Las Vegas to cover a motorcycle championship, which he's not the slightest bit interested in, and taking along a friend whose main interests, which the protagonist shares, are marijuana, ether, opium, trips, and pills galore. Now, the illustrator, Ralph Steadman, who was effectively half the book as he captured Hunter S. Thompson's so called gonzo journalism perfectly, with ink splashes and frantic scratchings, he was born in Cheshire and was a successful illustrator for many, many well-known books. Stedman stopped selling his artwork after he rather mistakenly sold the artwork for fear and loathing 
for $75. But we'll finish with an excellent example of a comic novel from America, published in 1980, though the author had died in 1969. It's the story of an obese, dyspeptic slob, well-versed in scholastic philosophy, and a great fan of Dr Pepper. That's Ignatius Riley. His mother, Irene Riley, is one of the main characters in the book. In real life, the author, John Kennedy Toole, had become rather depressed by the rejection of his typescripts and set off on what he said was going to be a road trip of America. He ended up in Biloxi, Missouri, where he fitted a tube to the exhaust pipe of his car, a tube that led into the car, where he sat until he died. But his mother was convinced that the novel she herself appeared in was more than just an ordinary novel. Thelma Riley was responsible for the publication, repeatedly calling Walker Percy, demanding that he read it. The lady was persistent, he recalls, and it somehow came to pass that she stood in my office handing me the hefty manuscript. There was no getting out of it, only one hope remained, that I could read a few pages that would be bad enough for me, in good conscience, to read no farther. In this case I read on, and on, first feeling it's not bad enough to quit, then with a prickle of interest, then excitement, and finally an incredulity. Surely it was not possible that it was so good. Well it is, it's sui generis, as so many of the best are, and I'm sure we'll have many more to come. But again, calling a halt at the turn of the 21st century or we'll be here forever. Now we've looked at the written word in many forms in this brief history. Scripts, novels, poems, and songs to come later. But let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum and look at comedy that doesn't exist until somebody blurts it out and it isn't written down. And in 99% of cases, never will be. It's the everyday humour, in fact, that you use when you're joshing or bantering or often in a normal back-and-forth conversation, or a Facebook interaction, or a comments section. But it's a skill you can put to comedic purpose, as we've seen in recent decades, a forgotten part of the history of comedy, and theatre, and music, and it's called improvisation. <laughs>